This week's episode is sponsored by Goldove's new science fiction horror film, Lumina, only in theaters Friday, July 12th. If you love government conspiracies, space, aliens, and some blood mixed with comedy, this is the movie many critics claim is the new cult classic on the block. There's no exaggeration there, because it really punches way above its weight. A terrifying sci-fi thrill ride. Lumina follows four friends desperately searching for their abductee friend in a dumb, deep, underground military base. Whether they find their friend or not, what they find in the desert of the U.S. to the sands of the Sahara will change their lives forever. In his feature directing debut, Gino McCoy leads a cast that includes the legendary Eric Roberts, as well as up-and-coming talent Rupert Lazarus, Eleanor Williams, Andrea Tividar. Sydney Nicole Rogers, Ken Lawson, and Emily Hill. Don't miss Lumina, only in theaters Friday, July 12th. Flashes, huh? What's your favorite scary movie? <laughs> um, not that one. <laughs> Hi, yes, uh, we are Joe and Trace with uh, Bloody Disgusting's Horror Queers podcast, uh, and uh, I think it's safe to say both Joe and I love the film, by the way. <laughs> Excellent. That's so good. All right, so um, Nicholas, uh, tell us about the genesis of the product project, though. Like, how, how did this idea form in your mind? <laughs> um, so I had the idea about uh, a character who um, is kind of not interested in being themselves anymore and has an opportunity to take the identity of somebody else and then regrets it. Uh, and I had tried that out with different stories. You know, um, one of them was a like a, a woman in the 80s in Palm Desert working for a bunch of yuppies as a waitress. And that that was quite good, a kind of rise to power thing, but that, that didn't quite work. And then I had another one set in the 50s about a, a woman who goes, does like the, the crossing from New York to London and uh, on the Queen Mary or something and and then kills a woman and takes her place so she doesn't have to be involved in an arranged marriage. Uh -huh. um, and that, again, that didn't quite take, you know. And then finally I went, around that time I went on a, um, I had a, I went to Vegas. I'm from Sydney, Australia originally, and I went to see some old friends from school. We all decided to meet up at Vegas, a place I'd never been. Mm. And, uh, and that was just kind of weird. And uh, started started me thinking about old friends, you know, and then and then that kind of was the beginning of this story. And then uh, one, once that was kind of in place, I was like, okay, so what are these old friends doing? Like I knew I'd had the envy thing. I knew that one friend would want the other one's life. And it was like, so it was just like a, a, like a process of asking myself questions of like, okay, what are these old friends doing? Why are they doing that? You know, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. And it just led to this. And I think the the whole piece in the end is just, uh, I don't know, it's just what I wanted to write. And also I wrote it um, during, I wrote it now, you know, in this climate, this sort of political, social climate that we're in where, you know, greed and money are very, very important over maybe other things that might be, um, that, that need our attention more. Just. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, so Nick, then when did you come on board? Like what, what attracted you to the character of Ryan? Um, did you audition for this or did I, uh, were you a pick? I, I guess I was a pick. Uh, yeah, there was no audition. Uh, just, you know, was sent the script. I don't, I don't know exactly uh, when it, um, time-wise it was um, sent to me, but um, I just loved it immediately. Mm -hmm. Um it was a great read, you know, um, uh, Nick did, you know, such an amazing job with the, with the story and, uh, liked Ryan right away, could relate to Ryan right away. Um, you know, and, uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, didn't take me too long to, to jump on board. Right. So um, we're going to treat this interview like people have already seen the film and will release it after the film has come out. So we're going to go into some spoilery territory, but obviously the film has a number of twists, uh, you know, not just the central premise, but then also what happens afterwards when, yes, Ryan does take over Jack's life. So we're wondering how you feel about the marketing, like 
the title, the trailer, uh, even the movie poster, like how does that work to retain a sort of mystery for the film, but also manage to still sell it? That's a really interesting question. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the title is always my title, What You Wish For, um, because obviously it's a play on Be Careful What You Wish For. Uh, mm -hmm. The film is ultimately a morality tale, I feel like, which is why the title is what it is. Um, there was some there was some balking at the title when we sold the film. And then I was like, okay, well, what do you want guys want to call it? And no one could come up with anything better. And they were also <laughs> like, oh, and it did really well at Fantastic and Fantasia and everyone knows about the movie now. And so it's kind of out there. So we're just going to go with it um, <laughs> in terms of the international sales. The, the Magnolia were like, we love the title. It's great. Um, so, but uh, yeah. And then working with Magnolia to, I mean, first of all, I'll just say, I love the poster and the, and the, and the um, trailer um, and I was working with Magnolia and, and, you know, these guys know what they're doing. They've got great taste. They do this all the time. And I was my, from my point of view, I was like, I, and I guess we're going to say spoilers here is what you've said. So yes. I can just go ahead and say, it. I said, I just don't want the cannibalism to be part of the trailer. I just don't want it to be, you know, cause I feel like if you give that away, then you kind of ruin what I think is one of the great pleasures of the film, which is not knowing that. And then, you sort of hitch a ride with this guy Ryan and you're kicking along with him and he's making these decisions and then it's like oh shit you know this this thing's happening and that I think just watching that with an audience I can see that that's a you know that's part of the pleasure of the film so we wanted to keep that out but then Magnolia were like yeah but we can't completely keep it out because we have to entice people that so in that if you know if you know what's if you've seen the film and then you watch the trailer it's you know it's all implied in there yeah and in terms of the poster I had actually sent um, uh, the poster company who made it um, a Magritte image that I really like, um, which is actually the same image that they use for The Exorcist, which is a uh, which is a, a, a blue sky, daylight above mm -hmm. and nighttime below on a house, and it's such an interesting. It's part of is painted in the twenties, nineteen twenties, and it's a surrealist artwork, but it's so simple, but it's so uncanny and unnerving. Um, that it implies something is is off, but it also is very visually very pleasing and stylish. So for all for like lots of reasons, I love that image, um, and I sent that to the poster guys. And they actually, the the poster we ended up using was the one where they incorporated that Magritte painting. So if you look at the the poster, it's it's based off a Magritte painting. Um, and uh, and of course, is using Nick and wearing looking very sexy in his Hawaiian shirt. I think that that really that's the icing on the on the poster for sure. You know, your sexiness. Nice, you mean? Uh, yeah. <laughs> touch. Nice touch. Yeah. No. <laughs> All right. Um, just to sort of tag along with that, you know, is there any danger? Like, do you two worry that you've crafted this like really intricately well made film that has a lot of genre possibility? But are you afraid that it's like, is it going to slip under the radar because people aren't going to think it's a genre movie? Like, it just kind of looks like a, ooh, guy gets in over his head when he's on vacation sort of film. Well, you can't, it's, it's, it's either you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think, like, this film is this is a limited release, low-budget movie by brought out by Magnolia, which are, you know, elevated niche, you know, American independent distributor. It's not going to be, like, it's not going to go against um you know mad max right it's not going to be we're not we're not going against that market this film i think if we're lucky is going to is going to live from word of mouth right yeah. it's going to come out people are, some people are going to see it and then hopefully over time more people will talk about it and talk about it and talk about it in the way that it makes sense to them you know so and they can be more nuanced in the way they describe it and like you know fingers crossed that's how hopefully this this film will live you know which is just through people telling their friends oh you got to see this film it's interesting yeah it, it, it's very much it whenever i tell people about it i'm always like just like, go in blind like don't read anything about it just watch it <laughs> was the plan always to do like either direct to vod or streaming like was there ever a discussion about theatrical release because i saw this with you at fantasia last summer and it right. killed with an audience in a theater it, it is having a theatrical release. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So it's playing, it's playing, having a limited, it's have, it's day and date on yeah. okay. the 31st, limited theatrical and VOD at the same time. Same day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. 
Well, okay. So the film deliberately provides only certain details of uh, the characters' backstories. You know, uh, we, we have minute details. So Nicholas, how did you decide what to reveal about each character versus what is inferred or never even confirmed in the film? Well, I just the film is told subjectively. Mm -hmm. And um, there's an, a, a certain amount of exposition that's necessary for the character, for the audience to get on board with Nick, Nick's, Nick's character. But you don't want to like just dish it all out in one big chunk, right? So it's sort of, you know, the, I was just viewing how many scenes do I need to sort of have something that, to establish a sort of human connection between these guys. And so you're mm -hmm. going to get a sense of who they once were and who they are now and that old friends reuniting but at the same time kind of give us some information about you know nick's character in particular um and i feel like in every scene in those in the beginning of the film you're getting a little you're getting little nuggets here and here and here and here so by the time that we're 20 minutes in you pr you pretty much know the full story about him um but in terms of the other characters i mean um you only know as much as nick knows you know yeah uh if, if nick doesn't find out we don't find out which is another, and which is another reason why I mean, the movie is subjective, and because I, I believe that to tell this story in the most effective and entertaining way, it had to be subjective, and yeah. so that's that. So it became simple once I understood it. Okay, it's subjective. So, you know. well, so then on that note, Nick, um, like, did, 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 how did you prepare to play Ryan, considering like what we know about him? Did you did you create a backstory between him and Jack uh, when you were preparing for this? Um, no, I mean, I, I feel like it was all. It was it was really all there for mm -hmm. me. I mean, I, I I feel like uh Nick wrote the perfect amount of um backstory for him and you know, um kind of uh you know, you know, just just the right amount about him. I um you know, it, it, you you find out the guy's in trouble, you know, um that he's got some some vices, you know, you find out what kind of work he was doing before you know, sort of, you know, what area he was in, what kind of work he was doing and things like that. Um, and you just see that, you know, I, uh, that's really all that, that I needed, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, he, he, he meets this old friend. Um, and the last time, uh, he saw this guy, they were, they were kind of equals, you know, they were both, uh, in the same boat and, um, and uh, all of a sudden, this guy has this beautiful looking life, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, so I, I did do some, I was just going to say, I, I, I did do some, uh, a little bit of like cooking training. Like, I was going to uh, say, yeah, did, did you do, <laughs> was that, yeah, is that really your hands doing all the cooking? <laughs> one time it is, I think, you know, I, you see me cutting at one point there. Um, I believe there's some hands that aren't mine at, at uh, certain times, but uh you know, I, I didn't have a lot of, of time to to uh, to try to get, you know, right. real good, good with the knives or whatever. But I, I did uh, um, do, you know, do some some work with a with a chef who was mm -hmm. uh, showing me some pointers and, and just some basics. You know, my my uh, my knowledge of all that was was next to nothing. So. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's 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 basically it. And then we just showed up and and uh, and filmed it. So. Mm -hmm. Was there a, um, like, uh, I, I, we get a good amount of details about the company. We, we kind of, again, infer a lot of things about it. Was there, like, more, there more, was there a more detailed backstory to the company that y'all had discussed or maybe that was originally in the script? No. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, the only thing, the only thing that, that I was worried, that there's only one question that I was still kind of answering myself when we were doing it is, is like, is does Imogen know, right? Because I feel like that's that's the thing, does Imogen know? And the thing that I realized, is that it doesn't matter if Imogen knows or not because of the sort of character that she is. Mm -hmm. Even if she knows, and we're going to full spoiler territory, yeah. but even if she knows that 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 Ryan is not Jack, the fact is is that they've got a dinner to prepare. It's happening tonight. Here's a guy who says he's this dude and he can cook. And if it doesn't work out, they're just gonna fucking kill him. Yeah. So it's like she has no options besides to just go with this guy. And there's no reason for her to tell him that she knows who he is. And and so she's just like, well, let's see. And then ultimately he wins. He succeeds. He's a talented chef and he does everything that she wants him to do. So she doesn't give a shit. She's like, great. And which is also the capitalist, you know, aspect of this movie, which is like, you're here to pull the lever. I love it. Mm -hmm. Keep doing it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she knows at one point. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, especially in watching her performance and what she did with it. And, um, you know, but like Nick said, I, I don't, I, I think it becomes irrelevant. 
at, at a certain point. Yeah. So I will confess that Imogen is actually my favorite character in oh, the film. No offense, Nick. <laughs> uh, she's just, I'm there's a you. lot of, yeah, like <laughs> there's just a lot of fun in that character. You know, the problem with Nick is that he's got a, sorry, the problem with uh, Ryan is that he's got to make all of this work, right? Like he's under duress the entire movie. Imogen is just kind of like, I'm having to deal with idiots all the time. So that's very enjoyable to watch. Yeah, but, it um, is. <laughs> it is. But I'm I'm wondering, Nicholas, like you, you mentioned, you know, how much does she actually know? And we can have that kind of debate, but how do you also keep her from becoming a villain, right? Because she is this embodiment of a capitalist structure that is quite literally willing to put innocent people on the table from like marginalized communities. So was it a balance in writing and getting that performance or even like Nick and how you interacted with her in character to make sure that she didn't become like this arch villainess? It's such, that's such a great question. It's so interesting because when we were shooting, any time that, that Tamsin would go into anger, I would be like, no. That's, I just intuitively was like, you cannot go, you cannot dip into anger. If you have anger, you have to conceal it. You have to, like, control it. And I think, it like, because the character's strength lies in her her ability to control herself. And, and that's also the tragedy as well. And that's also where, like, even there's a scene in the film where she's compassionate towards Nick and she's saying, and he sits down and he realizes that he can't get out of this and she's compassionate towards him. But even the compassion is controlled. You know what I mean? It's not outward. It's like, she's still, so she just, and because I think, I think the reason is, is because I think that she probably has gone through a similar situation to Nick years ago. And she's figured out how to compartmentalize this, which is like that speech she gives him, which is mm-hmm. like, hey, we're not as bad as these people. And in fact, we're helping people. And so she, you know, this is what she tells herself. And so all those elements combined, I think m- meant that when we were shooting and she was getting into actual anger on her face, it was like a, it was like a bad note, you know, a musician hitting a bad note. And I was like, you can, you can't do that. You know, that was the only, I, honestly, I can't think of any other note I gave her besides that, which was that anytime she went to that place, I felt like it wasn't the character. Um, and, and then when I was editing it, I think it was true. So that was, that was, an, and I think that's, I don't even know why that's true, but that's certainly the way that we did it. Hmm. Hmm. Um, well, so the, uh, kind of branching off of the image and stuff thing, cause there is a lot of dark humor in the film, particularly in the back half, you know, like, like when the guests uh, encourage Reese to eat, <laughs> to eat his nephew or, you know, cutting out else to tell you that there's a lot of playful editing that I think, but um, so how does the comedy, like, how do you, do that kind of delicate balance. I, I think it's a near perfect balance in the film personally, but like, how do you decide like if you're going too heavily into comedy versus like the thriller genre territory of the film? It was in the, it was the way I, it was the way that it was, it was in the script. Um, it was written that way. Right. I think mm-hmm. Nick was in the script that it was yeah, like, that. and so it was, I think everyone, and I think the reason that it, and that it feels uniform in the finished products is because it was in the script. And so when I was writing it, I mean, I don't know, man. I just wrote it and I wrote it and I revised it and revised. I just, it was labor. It was just yeah. a lot of labor about me going, that's not, that's not right. That's not right. I worked on the script really hard. Yeah. And I would, from an actor's perspective, um, I, I think um, it's, it's a, it's a tricky balance that, that Nick pulled off uh, with writing, you know, um, that balance of, mm-hmm. of the series, you know, dark, um, you know, um, uh, dramatic elements with with this dark comedy you know and uh and he helped he certainly helped me too you know i think it, it, it was it's tricky um uh, you know from an acting perspective too because um i felt like there was i you know at one point i just remember as an example like when the detectives get involved with the story you know mm-hmm. and they're actually they come into the kitchen you know my um I felt like I had this tendency um, to maybe go kind of broad with it. Like that's what I kind of thought I wanted to do was do this, this, this sort of like real stumbling, bumbling sort of like, you know, um, fish out of water thing, which I thought uh, would be funny or, or, you know, um, maybe I thought it would be somewhat, realistic too but it was just very hard to to i mean this 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 scenario was just a very hard thing to to put myself in the middle of but i think nick uh helped me and he sort of like brought me back down and sort of grounded me into to to he saw it as as being a little more relaxed and he was he was kind of cool under pressure um and i i think 
um, I, I, I think that was necessary um, for the for for the um, for the the Ryan character to to kind of ground the film in that way. Um, you yeah, because it could have been so slapsticky if you had been like parading around the kitchen and trying right. to negotiate that. Right, right. Nick the, and, and you know, and he kinda, pulled me the, back, pulled me back from that a little bit. There's a moment, there's a moment where that happens. It's actually my favorite part of that scene. There's a moment where where, where Ryan is like just bullshitting completely, just like, oh, this happened. Blah, blah, blah. And Imogen is like, and she sort of takes the mantle from him and she says, No, no, yeah. it is this, 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 and this to the cops. And then Nick goes, Yeah, right, right. As if as if yeah. that's just what he said, which I just think is hilarious. I love that moment because it's like mm-hmm. it's like just yeah. yeah, like what she said, you know. She said in a very, right. very small way. Right? It's like all that so- stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's my favorite part about Ryan is how he's a great chef and an absolutely terrible liar, and it just escalates as the film continues. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he seems aware of it too. She, she mm-hmm. really, uh, she, you know, Imogen kind of scolds him at one point. He's, he's like, I know, I, yeah, I know that sucked. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> so speaking about the kitchen, um, Nicholas, you know, I heard you describe a little bit about the optics of where to set the film or what not to disclose about where the film is set. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about where it's set geographically in your mind in the story, but then also what it's like to shoot in that house. In the, in the original script, there was actually a super that came up uh, on the first shot that said somewhere in Latin America. Right. And we like, but, but then that in the editing, we realized that was unnecessary, you know, but that, that was the idea is that, is it because it is a kind of um, morality tale by having it set somewhere sort of nondescript in Latin America, it became more maybe about the ideas than, oh, this is happening in Colombia, which is where we shot it. So it's not really set in Colombia. Right. It's really about Colombia. It's about like you guys was mentioning like colonialism and this idea of like, um, you know, rich people coming into a sort of developing country and with incredible, you know, with also incredible luxury and exploiting it, right? Um, but the house itself was just amazing. I mean, you know, we knew that we needed to find somewhere that was in, that anybody immediately would look at and go, oh, shit, you know, I'd love to live there, uh, which is exactly what the character of Ryan does. Yeah. Um, and so finding that house was a real uh, gift, you know. And the the sort of bunker area where we're cutting up bodies and making discoveries, is that actually part of that same house? Like, were you able to find it all in one location or is that a secondary set? That's the um, pool room underneath the pool that is a door to the pool room that was such a bit of luck. Um, that is the that is the exterior. And then we shot the interior in a set in Bogota. It was actually on our last day of filming. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that was the only set um on a stage that was used was that was that room huh. well okay so um I, I think we're gonna wrap this up uh so the, the end of the film is open-ended um uh and i i know it's probably not the the film that you jumped to like oh i want to do a sequel to that but like would would you two be open to doing a sequel like that would revisit ryan at a future location or even one that goes like digs deeper into the company in greater detail well, we, we were talking about this before, right? It's already laid out in the movie, right? Imogen, yeah. when Imogen is scolding Ryan, she's like, there are three scenarios. There's, you know, this uh, tourism, mm-hmm. you know, um, movie production and uh, property development. And mm-hmm. so this, the one we just seen is property development. So there's still tourism and uh, movie production. I want the movie one. <laughs> and then also at the end of the film, she's like, you're going to be on that job, the African job with us next month, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, if you, you have no soul. And she's like, well, you know. Um, so that's happening too. So it's it's either one of those two things in Africa somewhere. That. Yeah. Fingers crossed for that. I would gladly watch that. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Help us, oh. help us get some money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to yeah. get on that word of mouth. Uh, well, thank you all both so much for uh, for talking with us. This was really, really insightful. And again, we love the film and uh, we'll be pushing the hell out of it. Well, thanks, guys. We really appreciate it. Thank you.